I didn't think I'd be making another one of these so soon. Especially not just one month after putting together an 85 minute long video about sharks in gaming. But Abzu, from California based developer Giant Squid, is something a bit special and in a few ways that you might not be expecting. As such, now that it's been released and I've been able to play through it a few times, the game deserves having a bit more time dedicated to it. I could have just rushed through this to upload a video to try and catch the initial wave of hype with the game, but I'd rather take a little bit more time and be more comprehensive. The segment about Abzu in the previous Sharks in Gaming video was made entirely from pre-release footage and screenshots, and as such, it barely scratched the surface when it comes to our topic of interest here. Now, before we go any further, it's worth emphasising that the experience is a large part of Abzu. With its heavily stylized but still rather realistic art direction and the musical score interweaving so tightly with the on-screen events, you could almost imagine it as a modern-day interactive Fantasia segment. In some ways, perhaps the game actually surpasses Disney's efforts thanks to that interactive element. Spoilers are inevitable on a game like this, but I'm trying to minimise that by structuring the video into essentially two parts. The first part shall be mild spoilers by featuring every true species of shark in the game and where they can be found, which will also include which species are released from hidden pools. The second part, and I'll let you know when we get there, will delve more into story related events. If you like what you see and intend to play the game yourself, I would urge you to stop at that point so you can get the most out of it first hand. With that said, let's proceed with the sharks in the order that they can be encountered. The first ecosystem we encounter is this wonderful kelp forest, of which there are many along the California coast. When we first arrive, there are no sharks present. Instead, we activate this hidden pool and introduce the leopard shark into the environment. These little beauties are native to the west coast of North America, from Oregon down to Mexico. So this kelp forest is quite true to life to the kind of place where they are actually found. They are practically harmless to humans. Despite their preference for waters just offshore and only a few meters deep, there are no recorded instances of a leopard shark ever biting or injuring a human. The next shark we encounter, however briefly, is this scarred great white. We'll be seeing quite a bit of her throughout the game, but we'll get into that later in the spoiler section. Our next true shark encounter is in Chapter 2, and again, it's from a hidden pool, which introduces the Grey Reef Shark, the quintessential species of Requiem Shark. Due to its size, inquisitive nature, and frequent proximity to humans, especially spear fishermen, the Grey Reef Shark has been involved in numerous attacks though most have involved those same spear fishermen as they attempt to defend their catches and, in so doing, provoke the shark out of either defence or perceived competition. Grey reef sharks are also well known for their threat displays, swimming with an arched back, pectoral fins lowered and swimming with a slow and exaggerated side to side motion. Behaviour especially well documented by Mike de Grey in his documentary Sharks on Their Best Behaviour for the BBC. Sadly, Mike passed away in a helicopter crash back in 2012.
Next, we have one of the game's centerpieces, a scene that was heavily featured in pre-release material, a deep open water area with a giant bait ball made of giant trevelli. Now, technically a bait ball is more likely to be made up of smaller fish like sardines or anchovies, and species like trevelli would be amongst those to prey upon it. But I suspect this may be a technical limitation of current hardware, as you would have to render considerably more small fish to create a comparable effect. Amongst the predators on offer are more grey reef sharks, though perhaps a shark we'll be meeting a little bit later on would have been a more appropriate choice for this scenario. It's worth noting that the grey reef sharks we saw in the previous location had quite a bronze sheen to them, whereas the ones here appear a bit more silvery blue. I just thought I'd point that out because it shows that the colour of the water as well as the lighting has a rather significant effect on the appearance of the animals in the game. We also have a new arrival with the notorious oceanic white tip shark, the animal Jacques Cousteau described as the most dangerous of all sharks. This has to be taken in context of course. As an open water species, oceanic white tips live in an incredibly barren and hostile environment, the ocean equivalent of a desert. They often cannot afford to let a potential meal slip them by and so are very curious. That's not to say they are mindless man-eaters of course, but caution should be exercised. Provided there are alternative food sources around, humans really shouldn't be high on their list of priorities. With the likes of shipwreck survivors, such as those of the USS Indianapolis as described by Quint in Jaws, it's most likely that many of the victims actually died from other factors, such as hypothermia and dehydration, with the shark scavenging on the corpses. When interviewed, survivors of the USS Indianapolis usually cite thirst as their number one concern rather than sharks. Unfortunately, due to their large fins and habitat that largely consists of international waters, oceanic white tips are one of the most easily and so heavily targeted species for shark fin soup, which has seen dramatic drops in their populations in the last couple of decades. Diving down to the deepest depths of this area will also uncover another hidden pool that will release thresher sharks into this area. It would have been amazing to see these start to interact with the bait ball, slashing at it with their tail, but sadly there seems to be an invisible barrier of sorts that stops certain animals near the surface from diving too deep and those below from ascending to the surface. The Thresher Sharks also seem to be out of range of the game's meditate mode in this area, hence the limited footage I could gather. The same also seems to be true for this area's fourth shark, which is a bit of a special one. This huge basking shark slowly cruises around far below and is very easy to miss unless you are being thorough. It would have been nice to see this giant actually basking in the sun near the surface as it feeds, just as the real shark tends to do during the day, but c'est la vie.
From here we move on to this warmly coloured room. Perhaps the sun is setting, or perhaps it's the kelp and seaweed on the surface tinting the light orange. Here a new species swims around freely. Well, technically not a new species since we actually saw it briefly during an earlier sequence, but this is our first chance to identify and interact with them. This is the silky shark, which is one of the three most common open ocean sharks along with the blue shark and oceanic white tip, all three being requiem sharks. This is the shark which would have probably been more appropriate to join the oceanic white tips at the bait ball from the previous location. Silky sharks are not only just well documented feeding at bait balls, but even seem to have demonstrated cooperation amongst themselves and even other animals such as dolphins to help form them. There are another two species to be found in this area, both from more hidden pools. First, and with little need for introduction, is the scalloped hammerhead shark, an old friend from the Endless Ocean games. The scalloped hammerhead is the most common species of hammerhead shark, with ranges covering many coasts on both sides of the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, as well as some of the Western and Central Pacific. This is the species best known for gathering in giant schools made up of hundreds of individuals, and is the definitive hammerhead. Our third shark in this area is again via Hidden Pool, and it's another one we saw in Endless Ocean. In fact, it was the most elusive shark in Endless Ocean 2, the Zebra Shark. Okay, so the elephant in the room here is why the hell is it called a zebra shark, when something like a cheetah would seem like a more appropriate animal from the Serengeti. The answer can be found when looking at newly hatched sharks such as these. Born with black and white stripes, they undergo quite an impressive metamorphosis as they mature. From one small spotty shark to a giant one. The largest one in fact, as our next encounter, is these whale sharks, though I'm not entirely sure if these examples might actually be smaller than the basking shark we encountered earlier. The next shark is one you might actually miss unless you're paying attention, which would be a bit of a shame because it's a little cutie. The bonnethead shark is a small and timid shark with the smallest cephalofoil, i.e. hammerhead, of all the hammerhead sharks and is found around much of the Americas. Although it was once thought that the bonnethead sharks were one of the oldest hammerhead species, serving as a sort of intermediate stage between the more common shark form and the more pronounced hammerhead sharks, DNA analysis actually seems to indicate that it is one of the most recent evolutions.
And now to the deepest depths we go, to what could be described as a whale graveyard by the multiple skeletons scattered around. Whale graveyards, like elephant graveyards, are in fact a myth, but I think we can cut a little artistic slack here. A hidden pool reveals to us another old friend from our previous videos, the Goblin Shark. But look at that! They are correctly modelled. With a long, pointy nose and jaws retracted, which are then only extended when they snap at food, Abzu can in fact claim to have the most accurate goblin shark in any video game. Oh, let's see that again. Beautiful. Well done, giant squid. Yes, Endless Ocean 2 did briefly show them correctly, but that was only for a few seconds in a cutscene. During any gameplay or in the game's encyclopedia, their jaws are stuck sticking out, so that doesn't count. It's also quite nice to see the cat's eye effect of your light reflecting off their own eyes. The same effect is present in depth, but it's executed quite a lot better here. Now, through events which I'm not going to elaborate on in this part of the video, we next find ourselves, for whatever reason, in a prehistoric ecosystem with one particular fish of note for us, Helicoprion. It's probably the second or third best known prehistoric shark after, of course, Megalodon, and possibly Stethacanthus. Its lower jaw has baffled experts ever since it was discovered, but the most recent data as of 2013 suggests the tooth whorl was actually located more towards the back of the jaws. Older theories, such as the tooth whorl unravelling and striking forward like a chameleon's tongue, have largely been discounted. Of course, as with many prehistoric animals, there is always some debate to be found. There are some that believe that Helicoprion is not actually a shark. Rather, that it is part of the closely related Chimera group of cartilaginous fishes that diverged from sharks over 400 million years ago. But, for the sake of this video, let's consider it interesting enough to look at nonetheless, even if the depiction may be slightly outdated compared to the most current theories. There are also other ancient fish here that are closely related to sharks, but are not actually classed as such, so we'll be skipping over those. There is one final normal shark to be encountered, and that is the Great Hammerhead, but what I can show you here is very limited in this minor spoilers only section. It's in a small area without a meditation statue, so it's easy to miss by mistaking it to be a scalped hammerhead shark. Right then, now it is spoilery time. Again, if you do intend to play this game, it's for your own benefit that you do so now before continuing. You sure you're sticking around? Last chance. Alright then. Throughout the game, we have fleeting encounters with a great white shark, identifiable by the scars on its left flank and over its left eye. At first, we are led to believe that this shark is our antagonist, simply stalking us and a threat.
But towards the end of the game, and when you think back on it, the shark isn't following us. We are often following the shark. Throughout the game there is a huge amount of shark symbology. Whereas we might expect to see stone idols or wall paintings and murals of whales and dolphins, what we actually see in Abzu is lots of sharks. The meditation statues in the various ecosystems are reminiscent of ancient Egyptian gods such as Anubis, but instead depict people with the head of sharks, and the same can be seen on other statues and paintings. For those that pay attention, you might well notice paintings of a glowing blue shark with the same scars as the great white we keep seeing. About two thirds of the way through the game, we start encountering strange inverted pyramids which seem to function like mines, forming the only objects which can seemingly hurt our diver, although it must be said you cannot fail or die in this game. Nonetheless, it is still something that you will find yourself trying to avoid. Soon enough, we will find that the Great White has fallen foul of one of these mines and become trapped. and we help it. We save the shark. It isn't long before we find the origins of these mines, and also the little robot drones, which apparently come from the same source, and so explaining the shark's earlier hostility towards them. Left unsaid is our diver's own connection to this facility, but it seems that our intent is to stop it. And then, this happens.
the shark dies. But let's take in for a moment what Abzu is asking us to do here. Not just to feel sympathy for this great white shark, but to actually mourn its passing. The shark wasn't our enemy, it was actually our friend and the game's intention is for us to feel this loss. When you stop and think about it, this is actually quite a big moment for a piece of mainstream entertainment that has the reach of the video games industry. Whether or not it was intended to be the message, I can't really say, but it's still quite a moment that may be missed by many. This wasn't a friendly dolphin, a majestic whale or something else cute or helpless. It's a great white shark. And we mourn for it. Of course there have been documentaries which have tried to do this, such as the feature length Shark Water and others which have graphically shown the effects of finning. But as a work of fiction where they purposefully chose this and scripted it out, that's a bit special. Of course the game draws massive inspiration from the Babylonian creation myth, hence the name of the game, but still. I'm perfectly prepared to overlook the Great White having a nictating membrane during this scene rather than rolling its eye backwards as artistic license. Fret not however, as ultimately this shark shall be revived, becoming the glowing shark we saw in the murals. It's a close companion throughout the final section of the game, which is why I couldn't really show you much of the Great Hammerhead earlier, because our friend is almost always in shot. Riding this Great White also unlocks the Connection achievement. So that is Abzu, and maybe now you can see why I decided to make this video dedicated to it as part of what I suppose has almost become a sort of series. I hope you enjoyed this and some of my own personal insight into the game. But for now, let's just watch some sharks.